Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Well, this is up. I'm David Gura flagging some new reporting from my colleagues here at NBC News. We have learned that two White House security specialists rejected Jared Kushner's application for a top secret security clearance. There were questions reportedly about his family's business, his foreign contacts, his foreign travel, and meetings Jared Kushner had during the campaign. But their decision was overruled. House Democrats have launched a high-profile investigation into the administration's security clearance process. Behind me are some of the men and women likely to uh, be of interest to them. In addition to Jared Kushner, you've got Michael Flynn, Rob Porter, Sebastian Gorka, Michael Flynn Jr., and KT McFarland. Joining us now is one of my colleagues who broke that story, Ken Delaney. And Ken, let's dig a bit into uh, uh, the substance of, of why they rejected this, why they recommended this be rejected to begin with. Sure, David. Just to emphasize, though, what the, the import and the meaning of this story Two, two career security specialists at the White House decided that the president's son-in-law did not merit access to the nation's secrets. But their boss, who had been hired by the Trump administration, overruled them and he got it anyway. And the questions about Kushner, um, you know, are sort of well known, have been reported. Um, his businesses, his real estate empire has many foreign entanglements. He met with a Russian during the campaign um, to talk with a sanctioned bank. He, he had a troubled... Um, building on Fifth Avenue in New York, um, and he was in talks with foreign sovereign wealth funds about investments. And when he went to fill out his form for the security clearance, initially he failed to list any foreign contacts. These are all things that um, experts tell me would rule out a normal person for a clearance. And what happened is, you know, the FBI does a background check. They don't reach a conclusion, but they present their findings to these career people at the White House, who've been doing this, by the way, for many years, mm. David. And two career people looked at this application and said, no, he doesn't deserve a top secret clearance. Their boss, though, who had been brought in by the Trump administration, he's a civil servant, but hired by a Trump political, overruled them. And this was one of 30 times, David, that this happened in the year period, we are told. And that is unprecedented. John, I want to get your reaction to this. Uh, just the, the story of itself, what Ken's highlighting there, how, how unprecedented this is, how extraordinary it is that career officials would have this uh, overturned. You, you can't quite believe that if you've got career professionals whose job it is to keep the nation's secrets safe, and they have determined that the person who is being sought, seeking clearance is not safe, that they end up with that clearance. I mean, there are many differences between the UK and the US, but where we have a very strong professional civil service in the UK, there is just no way that you would have somebody's name being put forward for a security clearance, or the highest level security clearance, and then if the kind of spy masters or whoever, the intelligence experts say, it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. There is no kind of, well, because we've got this place person that the Prime Minister has put in there, they will overrule it. Just couldn't happen. And that's just one of the kind of really, I find really puzzling, that if you have got the nation's secrets mm. that are meant to be above the party political dogfight, how is it possible that that happens? Francesca, how surprised were you by this reporting? You hear this defense from this administration that they brought in a bunch of people with untraditional backgrounds. That's a phrase right. that they like to use. I think Ken, uh, Peter Alexander, our colleagues, used that in the piece uh, as well. Very that's a wealthy. defense that we've heard time and time again. And, and very wealthy, and that matters here because that's why, in some cases, they have all these entanglements. And you, you have to recall that originally this came up because we found out during the entire Rob Border scandal that there were individuals like Jared Kushner who had been working 
taking the entire time of the Trump administration without these clearances because they were still being vetted and these background checks were being re-background checked mm. and whatnot. And, and, and so this is sort of some of the fallout when people started taking a look and saying, oh my gosh, how is Jared Kushner having access to the nation's secrets, sitting in on the president's daily intelligence briefing, and he doesn't have, I mean, he has the temporary clearance, but he hasn't fully received the clearance. And part of the reason is because of the wealth. Kendalini, but also because they didn't tell the truth that as well, on, of course. The, 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 the omissions, <laughs> right. sure the omissions as well. Ken, where are we now, and where are we where are we headed? I'm just curious, sort of, what type of clearance we we know. We don't know that uh, that Jared Kushner has at this point. And I mentioned that the House investigations. Uh, to what degree is this going to be looked into? Excellent question, David. There is another beat to this reporting, which is after. Um, those White House career people were overruled for the top secret clearance. Jared Kushner, being a senior government official in the White House, was seeking an even higher, what some call a higher level of clearance for sensitive compartmented information. The CIA makes the decision about that. They sent Kushner's application over to the CIA. The CIA adjudicator said, wait a second. They called back to the White House and said, how did you even give Kushner a top secret clearance? And our reporting is that as of now, Jared Kushner does not have that SCI designation. And what that means, David, is he, in many cases he doesn't have access to NSA intercepts, to CIA source reporting. It's hard to imagine how anybody can do a job in charge of Middle East peace or liaison with Mexico without access to that intelligence. And to answer your question about where this is going, um, immediately after our story hit, um, the chairman of the House, Oversight Committee Elijah Cummings, issued a statement and said he would absolutely investigate this. It's our understanding he intends to subpoena, if he needs to, all the players in this story, including Carl Klein, the White House official, no longer there, by the way, who made these decisions to overrule. Because the big question here, David, is was this man acting on his own or was he acting under instruction from political appointees at the White House who were concerned that people were not getting clearance. And uh, your point about him not having access to those NSA uh, intercepts, it is something uh, I should point out that the president could authorize uh, if he wanted to. He could allow Absolutely Jared Absolutely true. That's right. It is Monday, the 28th of January of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is... River City Hash Mondays. It's been another one of those weekends. Oh, my. And uh, we really have a wonderful, wonderful River City Hash. We just put it all together and mix it up. And the weekend is uh, repurposed on Monday for you. Indeed. Wow, wow, wow. It looks like Trump has been giving tours in the White House and uh, pretty much insulting every single president that came before him. And he tells everybody, oh yeah, Obama just, all he did was watch basketball. There was a hole in the wall here in, in this office when I first came. The, the, the whole White House was just rough. Yeah, I think what he meant to say is that a black guy lived there just before he did. That's what he really means. And uh, the racism just seeps right on through. But uh, that's the kind of uh, guy occupying the White House right now. Supposedly the leader of the free world. Uh, looks like uh, the uh, walls, <laughs> no pun intended, are crumbling. They are pushing in on him. And I think he's going to be crushed by his own petard. I know, I know, I know. Do not mix metaphors. But it is Monday. So uh, just, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, patience with us here, and we'll get through this indeed. Well, there's some GOP guy who uh, hires a lot of kids and wants to get rid of all child labor laws. Where's this guy from again? Well, he doesn't say, but uh, not in the headline at least. And so uh, that has actually been a libertarian dream for quite a while. I mean, the market wants what the market wants, and the market will get what it wants. So let the market do it. Okay, great. Speaking of letting the market do it, uh, apparently uh, a befuddled and baffled Larry Kudlow was ordered by Trump when Larry Kudlow first came on board to shut down a non-existent Amazon deal. Well, <laughs> that must be pretty easy to shut down if it doesn't exist. I shut it down, Donnie. Donnie will say, way to go, Larry. Uh, let's do a line. And they probably did. And so the nation uh, is held in the balance. Okay. So much for so much for democracy, huh? <laughs> Are we going to get it back? Oh, uh, also I love I love this uh, story 
in uh, Christie's book. Or no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, not Christie's book. Another insider, uh, a Trump psychophant, actually, who described the first meeting between Trump and McConnell as a scene right out of Goodfellas. And, and, and McConnell, uh, though he looks like a little turtle, well, apparently Trump looked at him as a, a cold-eyed snake, mean as a snake. And uh, Trump was actually pretty shocked because, you know, he's hung around some pretty rough people in both uh, the Sicilian mobs in New York and the Russian mob in New York and around the world. And those are pretty rough characters. And he thinks that McConnell is way more mean, which uh, most of us who have been in the know (laughs) know this because, well, look at McConnell. He looks like a turtle. But he's really a snake. Well, what's on the rest of the menu here today in the Bistro Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? River City Hash Mondays. Well, that was Ken Delanian at the top uh, explaining how Jared Kushner's security clearance was initially denied by quite a few intelligence officials up and down the line, but was later approved by an administration hack who was hired just for the job. And then this guy went on and overturned and approved 30 other security clearances. So I would assume there may be a purge. There better be. You can't just get rid of Trump and and hopefully Pence. Yeah, there's a lot of embeds in this government and we need to root them out we are on a spy hunt let's not forget it well on the rest of the menu one of the america's worst gerrymanders suffered a potential fatal blow well it looks like maybe north carolina is actually going to have free and fair elections again a former surgeon general warns that trump's war on science is as egregious as he's ever seen. And after the end of the longest government shutdown in U.S. history, White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney made it clear that Trump would be willing to do it all over again. Of course, he's already talking about that. Talking about moving the goalposts. After the break, we then move to the chef's table where China has jailed prominent rights lawyer Wang Guangzhang for four and a half years for subversion of state power. Yeah, you want human rights? That's definitely a subversion of state power. Off you go. And over 10,000 protesters wearing scarves marched through Paris on Sunday to condemn violence in the Yellow Vest Movement. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the rightish of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And thank you, Kelly, for doing that. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then notice the contribute button. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, that recurring contribution puts a big dent in paying our bills and we we really thank you for that and the generosity that you have expressed in doing that because resistance radio is not free and it doesn't come cheap unfortunately they make you pay your bills and sometimes they keep raising the cost of the bill how dare they but thank you so much for doing that and also thank you to our recent patreons and uh, a couple of you apparently uh, are okay without getting what patreon calls benefits 
and uh, but I'm giving you a shout out now anyway, so thank you very much. Okay, if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do that, and you can find us on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that platform, and we are forever grateful to him for doing that. And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I am on Daily Co's as Justice Putnam, where you will find the show notes and links diary that I post about 10 minutes before showtime. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 Okay, I had, uh, Saturday was an exceedingly rough day for me in this, in this chronicle of grief. I, I just, I don't know what hit me, but, uh, it hits me every day at some point. But Saturday was just the longest of all the days since my son passed. Um, could be that I've been suppressing a lot of it. And when you do that, of course, it's going to bubble up and over. Um, but yeah, it was really hard. Uh, cried most of the day I'd, I'd be doing something and then suddenly the tears would just be in sheets down my, down my cheeks, uh, start off as like drops and then became a sheet. Wow. So, uh, I, I appreciate folks who reached out to me. Um, I, I am doing okay. Uh, but it's still hard. Um, I keep, I keep saying and and I actually believe this, that there was nothing lacking in my son's and my relationship. I mean, we talked about most everything, but I'm trying not to fall into this trap of all the things left to talk about, you know, <laughs> because that way is nothing but sadness. So I try to maybe avoid that. Maybe I'm making a mistake by avoiding it, but uh, I'm aware of it. And, uh, it's uh, just a way of beating myself up and that's not healthy either. So, uh, well, we all get through these intellectually. I know that, but it's still so very, very, very hard. Okay. Well, let's get on with, uh, what's up here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays, by the way. Well, it looks like North Carolina may soon have free and fair elections again. Ian Milheiser brings us this first offering in the Bistro Cafe. For, lo- for the last several election cycles, North Carolina has not held Democratic elections for its state legislature. In the 2018 state House election, for example, Democrats won 51 percent of the statewide popular vote, yet Republicans walked away with a 65-55 majority, thanks to an aggressive gerrymander that all but ensures Republican control in North Carolina. Well, they won. (laughs) Yeah, when you rig the game. Yet two recent developments, one of them very recent, make it exceedingly likely that North Carolina will have fair and fair free elections in 2020. The first is a lawsuit called Common Cause versus Lewis, which was filed in North Carolina State Court last November. The suit asked the state courts to declare that partisan gerrymandering violates the state constitution and to establish new state house and state senate districting plans for 2020. The second development is North Carolina Chief Justice Mark Martin's announcement on Friday that he plans to leave his court in order to become dean of Regent University Law School. (laughs) Regent. Oh, my God. And that's described as a Christian-identified school in Virginia founded by televangelist Pat Robertson. Although North Carolina typically fills its courts via partisan elections, Democratic Governor Roy Cooper will appoint a replacement for Martin who will serve until the next election. That means that the state Supreme Court, which is already heavily Democratic, is about to have a 6-1 Democratic majority. The state's gerrymandered maps are, to say the least, unlikely to survive contact with such a court. If the state holds Democratic elections in 2020, 
that could have profound implications for the next decade. In North Carolina, both congressional and state legislative maps are drawn by the state legislator and are not subject to a gubernatorial veto. Moreover, because 2020 is a census year, whoever prevails in that year's state legislative races will get to draw the maps for the next 10 years. So if Democrats prevail in 2020, they could eradicate Republican gerrymanders in that state for at least a decade. Not only might Democrats have a real shot at taking the state legislator in the near future, but the vote could help solidify Democrats' majority in the U.S. House of Reps. Currently, Democrats control just three of the state's 13 congressional districts, despite the fact that Democratic candidates frequently prevail, let me rephrase that, frequently prevail in statewide races thanks to a Republican gerrymander on the state's congressional seats. Take that gerrymander away, and Democrats could potentially gain as many as three or four U.S. House seats in a strong election year for their party. Next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes our way by way of Share Blue Media, and it is written by Carolyn Orr. Now, we already know that this month-long plus uh, delay or, or government shutdown has now put a massive delay in all aspects of the government, that this this shutdown has much longer lasting implications than just the month plus that we were shut down. And it also follows that uh, Trump's egregious attack on science is going to be a long lasting implication as well. It its effect is going to be longer lasting than Trump's tenure in office. Let's be clear about that. Since the day that Trump took office, his administration, with the help of Republicans in Congress, has waged war on science, prioritizing industry interests instead of evidence, and putting their right-wing agenda ahead of the public good. Now, public health experts and former government officials who have worked in both Republican and Democratic administrations are warning that this pattern of putting politics ahead of science is endangering the health and safety of Americans in ways that have never been seen before, with consequences that could last far into the future. It's as egregious as I've ever seen it, starting from the very top with the president, just denying the existence of science, manipulating the system on behalf of special interests, former Surgeon General Richard Carmona told The Guardian. While the Trump administration's hostility toward climate science has often taken center stage, and for good reason, this has allowed other anti-science policies and their devastating human impact to go unnoticed. For example, the administration dismissed evidence showing that healthier school lunch standards established during the Obama administration were not only effective in encouraging kids to eat healthier foods, but could prevent nearly 2 million cases of childhood obesity over the next decade. Now, of course, Trump eats junk food. That's his main source of nutrition. He eats that junk morning, noon, and night. And you know he says there's nothing wrong with me. Now, the consequences of that decision could affect children for the rest of their lives. Research shows that whole grains help children concentrate better in school and also contribute to healthy weight maintenance. In contrast, refined grains can cause people to overeat and promote weight gain, leading to an increased risk of diabetes and heart disease. 
with more than half of the U.S. children on track to be obese by age 35. The decision to roll back school lunch standards could put even more children at risk of obesity and associated diseases. Now, of course, I've said this before. If you have a population that's about ready to die, you get to deliver the property vacant, and property is always more valuable when delivered vacant. the new civil rights movement brings us this final offering here in the bistro cafe of west coast cookbook and speakeasy river city hash mondays well after the end of the longest government shutdown in united states history mick mulvaney warned that trump would be willing to do it all over again face the nation host margaret brennan asked mulvaney if Trump was really prepared to shut down the government in another three weeks. Well, yeah, yeah, I think he actually is, Mulvaney said. Keep in mind, he's willing to do whatever it takes to secure the border. He does take this very seriously. This is a serious humanitarian and security crisis. And as president of the United States, he takes the security of the nation as his highest priority really mick are you sure about that after a disastrous government shutdown precipitated by trump's refusal to compromise on his demands for billions of dollars for a southern border wall the government managed to pass a bill funding and reopening the government for three weeks during that time trump apparently expects to get the money for his wall he doesn't want to shut down the government again. Let's make that very clear. He doesn't want to declare a national emergency. What he wants to do is fix this the way th that things are supposed to get fixed with our government, which is through legislation. Really? Has he done that yet? With all those executive orders? How about a back channel to Russia? How is that including the legislative branch? Mulvaney then pushed to the blame on Democrats because that's all they know. <laughs> One of the reasons he agreed to open the government this week, Mulvaney uh, declared, was to essentially take the Democrats at their word while their leadership had been telling us they were not interested in negotiating. And they were sort of taking this do nothing and hope the president gives up approach, said Mulvaney. There were many, many, many Democrats, both rank and file, and some lower levels of leadership would come to us and say, look, we, we happen to agree with you on border security. And some of them were even very public about it. Really? <laughs> were they? I think that cock is held together pretty damn well, Mick. And you're going to find out how well it holds together in the next three weeks when we go through this all over again. All right, let's get to our break. And when we come back from that break, we're going to go through weather from around the world. And then we're going to go through the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. <laughs> From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth.
This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Just Step. Ruth Bader Ginsburg now occupies a place in popular culture that is unprecedented for a Supreme Court justice. Just last year, she was the subject of the popular Magnolia Pictures documentary, RBG. Now, played by Rogue One's Felicity Jones, Ginsburg's back on the big screen in her own biopic, On the Basis of Sex. Producer-slash-director Mimi Letter and screenwriter-slash-Ginsburg nephew Daniel Stiepelman have made a film that starts with Bader Ginsburg entering Harvard Law School in 1956, only six years into Harvard letting women in at all. Bader Ginsburg enters one year behind her husband, Martin Ginsburg, played by Armie Hammer, who against all expectation is developing a really cool filmography. And all of this is an appetizer for the main dish, 1972's Charles E. Morris versus the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue, i.e. the IRS, which both Ginsburgs argued before the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and in which Bader Ginsburg first develops her strategy for future gender discrimination cases, where the film shows her legal secretary inventing the term gender discrimination. That's how ground level we are here. Steepleman aptly melds the film's personal and professional plots to tell the same story. On one hand, you have Ruth and Meredith's marriage, which is an even domestic partnership strengthened by mutual support and respect that shines in contrast to the hidebound discrimination that Bader Ginsburg suffers both in her education and in her job, and which she eventually fights in the courts. Felicity Jones plays Bader Ginsburg a little more fiery than fans of RBG have grown to know her as, but it's the more dramatic choice. Behind the camera, Letter tells the story well. One of my favorite things is how she uses Ginsburg walking as both a visual motif and as a metaphor for the movie's theme, that legal discrimination is an evil built step by step and is dismantled the same way. So who's the next justice to get a movie? I hope it's Brett Kavanaugh. Maybe Harvey Weinstein will produce it. I hear he's not doing anything right now. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. So I never really thought I'd study penis size, but I sort of stumbled on this topic. Mark Lydra, a biologist at Dartmouth College. Lydra travels to Costa Rica to study hermit crabs, a species called Cenobita compressus. These land crabs do some interior remodeling of their adopted shells. They extensively hollow them out, removing struts called spiral columella to give themselves some extra elbow room. The renovation renders the shells more precious to their owners and to other covetous crustaceans as well. These more valuable shells, though, are also more easily stolen, since without the spiral columella inside the shell to grip onto, individuals are pretty liable to have their property snatched from them, particularly when they are engaged in other activities, like copulation, which requires coming partway out of the shell. Despite his work in the field, it wasn't until Lydra was wandering through a museum that he noticed something about his favorite crabs. The really striking thing was that Cenobita compressus, the one whose social behavior I've been studying for so many years, had an unusually large penis, in fact bigger than any of the other species. The observation gave him an idea, which he dubbed the private parts for private property hypothesis. In essence, the hypothesis posits that in large private parts can be an adaptation, extending a male's sexual reach and thus enabling both him and his partner to remain safely tucked away inside their shells while they copulate thereby protecting the private property of their shells from being stolen during sex. Darwin proposed a similar idea to explain why barnacles, which are stuck in one place, are so amply endowed. To test his private parts for private property hypothesis, Lydra sized up more than 300 male museum specimens, including hermit crabs that live on land and at sea. And he found that crabs that carried custom coverings had the most impressive carnal equipment, At the same time, species that got their shells off the shelf had bigger gear than did crabs that walked around with no shell at all. His results are revealed in the Royal Society journal Open Science. It's intriguing to think that this hypothesis might have greater generality beyond hermit crabs. But like a hermit crab encountering a humdrum shell, Lydra says he's going to leave that one alone. For me, I'm much more curious about how forms of animal architecture and remodeling in the environment impact social behavior. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Sweetie, want some fruit? You have to use the right tool for the job. A power drill is the wrong tool to slice fruit. Just like an antibiotic is the wrong tool to treat viruses, including colds and flu. Antibiotics are only needed for certain bacterial infections. 
When they aren't needed, antibiotics won't help you, and the side effects could still hurt you. Ask your healthcare professional when an antibiotic is the right tool and when it's not. Visit cdc.gov slash antibiotic dash use. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2017, approximately one in six high school students reported a sports or physical activity-related concussion. Immediate symptoms of a concussion include headache, nausea, and double vision. Long-term, the effects of such injuries, particularly those that are more severe, can be life-changing. Healthcare providers, coaches, trainers, and parents should be aware of the symptoms of a concussion and how to treat them. A concussion protocol should be developed that includes withholding an athlete from practice and competition until all symptoms are resolved. While concussions cannot always be prevented, they can be treated in a way that decreases the chances of long-term health problems. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. After a storm or disaster, it's important to eat only safe food. Throw away perishables like meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and leftovers stored above 40 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours or more. Throw away food with an unusual odor, color, or texture. Throw away food that may have come in contact with flood water, including food in swollen, punctured, and damaged cans. When in doubt, throw it out. It's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution And you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Quote, a federal judge has blocked the Commerce Department from adding a question on American citizenship to the 2020 census, handing a legal victory to critics who accused the Trump administration of trying to turn the census into a tool to advance Republican political fortunes. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute, and that was the opening paragraph in the New York Times report under the headline, Judge Rejects Census Query on Citizenship. The census matters. It determines how congressional seats are allocated and federal funds distributed. And the question about citizenship, the government agrees, will scare off many persons from responding to the census questionnaire. Indeed, the Commerce Department itself predicted that the question would reduce voluntary responses by about 6 million, an estimate that makes eminent sense given that there are 24 million non-citizens living in the United States, about 11 million of whom are undocumented, and the fear factor among immigrant families, regardless of their status, to answer an official government document, well, that just makes plain sense. However, the decision from Federal District Court Judge Jesse Furman is only the first battle in the legal war. The case likely will reach the Supreme Court before the 2020 census forms are printed in the summer of 2019. So stay tuned. This case really matters. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. I'm Mark Belanger. January 24, 2019 is the first International Day of Education. 
The day has been established by UNESCO to remind people about the importance of quality education for the development of human-centered societies. As a United Nations agency, UNESCO is working on the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Goal number four calls for inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning. One of the labor organizations which supports the day is Education International. EI is the Global Union Federation, which represents teachers and other education workers. Its affiliated unions include some 32 million workers in 172 countries. To find out more about the work towards quality education in the world, I talked to Haldis Holst. Ms. Holst is Education International's Deputy General Secretary. I asked her about the efforts in meeting the UN's Sustainable Development Goal 4. We are moving forward towards the goal, but there's an awful lot way to, still to go. There are so many children out of school. There are so many children that are not offered quality education and definitely a lot of children that are not offered free education. So we are still working hard on the ground through our affiliates and also from the global level to remind governments which they actually signed on to when they adopted the Sustainable Development Goal, and specifically Goal 4, they still have a lot of work to do. Is Education International concerned about any particular regions of the world? Well, we know that some of the largest uh, challenges do lie, like on the African continent, and uh, specifically, you know, South of Sahara, but also there are in all continents, there are challenges, because this goal is about offering all children quality education and I think just about every country on the planet do have some groups of children that they still haven't been able to reach with the quality level of education that's good. You know, there may be indigenous children, there may be disabled children, maybe children living in remote areas. So it's not just about the aggregated numbers, it's about that every single child matters and every single child has a right to receive quality education. So we need to be on the alert everywhere. I have heard some people argue that one of the most effective ways of providing education is to privatize the educational systems, to bring in private operators. What does Education International think of that idea? We're not too fond of that one because uh, actually it is a government responsibility, which they have signed on, to uh, to offer education and that uh, education at least primary and secondary, they've also committed to has to be free of charge. And it's very difficult, especially if you're a commercial private actor, to deliver education that is free on delivery for the children. And it's also that governments cannot sort of outsource their responsibility. Uh, Education is a public good. It's their responsibility as a government to their citizens to make sure that you get education, which actually is an individual human right. So we're not too fond of the actors that are in there to make a profit off Children. Education International has been conducting a long time campaign to make education free of charge. This includes university education, tertiary education, as it's called. How has that campaign been going? We must admit that the world has not signed on to that tertiary education should be free of charge. They have not signed on to that early childhood education should be free of charge. They've signed on to that it should be affordable and accessible. We would have wished that it was all free of charge to really be accessible for all. And it's not such a utopia. I actually come from a country where higher education is free of charge. Of course, you have to pay your living costs and so on. But it is possible to do it if you actually invest in it and see it as an investment in your population for the future. We're not quite there yet. But it's uh, about taking steps and making sure that you have schemes on the the ground, which may actually makes it possible for students to uh, to study, and it's to invest in public higher education. That you make sure you have quality public institutions that don't need to make a profit off their students. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. The U.S. military carried out new airstrikes against al-Shabaab terrorists this week in Somalia, striking back against the al-Qaeda-linked group a week after it claimed responsibility for an attack in the Kenyan capital Nairobi that left 21 people dead. 
the Trump administration has been working hard to combat al-Shabaab. Bronwyn Bruton is the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. The interesting thing is they're mostly doing the same things that the Obama administration had done, except that they're relying an awful lot more on airstrikes to get the job done. Case in point, the U.S. carried out 47 strikes against al-Shabaab in 2018, up from 38 the year before. Just last week, the U.S. said it killed 52 of the terror group's fighters in a single strike, one of as many as 10 strikes so far this year. And there's reason to be concerned about al-Shabaab beyond its attacks in neighboring Somalia. Bruton says the U.S. has long worried Somalia could become a safe haven for terrorists, with the country's central government too weak to do anything about it. The immediate fear is that somebody who works with al-Shabaab, a a Somali who has an American passport, may be radicalized and use that passport to get into the States. I don't think that's something that people are afraid of happening tomorrow, but it's something that may well happen in years to come. But Bruton says that if that's the concern, a U.S. decision this week to stop reporting casualty counts from its airstrikes and instead hand those duties over to the Somali government could transform that country into another theater of American warfare hidden from the American public, but very much visible to those suffering on the ground. We know from American activities in Afghanistan and the Middle East, And when we have too many airstrikes that wind up killing too many civilians, it actually winds up backfiring. I think it's going to be really hard to see that backfire coming if we don't have good reporting on this. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Ash Mondays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States. Of America, because there's a lot more of America where we come from. And it is currently... 33 degrees Fahrenheit, it even feels like 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is important. It really is. Winds are a negligible uh, one mile per hour, which is usually known as light and variable, out of the east, by the way, and will remain out of the east in light and variable conditions for the next four days or five days or so. We are currently under an extended air stagnation warning as well. Uh, And that air stagnation uh, advisory extends through tomorrow. And we are currently under a dense fog advisory. And that will be uh, lasting until a, a few hours from now, two, three, maybe four hours from now. The fog should be lifted to a much more safe saturation. Indeed. All right. It looks like uh, we're going to have uh, highs in the mid to upper 50s. Lows will be in the low 40s. And that will be uh, pretty much the forecast, except, uh, well, we'll be in the upper 50s, low 60s uh, starting tomorrow. So a bit of a range there. Uh, pollen is considered none. Oh, dry conditions will continue, by the way. We have some forecast of rain about Wednesday. So a couple of days from now. Uh, the air quality index is currently good at 46, though with the air stagnation aspect, that could uh, turn bad really quick. And the daytime UV index is at low and rated at 2. Indeed. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.96 inches. Visibility is down to three miles and relative humidity is at 90%. Well, so much for dry conditions now, huh? Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. 
London is 42 degrees and sunny with a weather advisory, and I'm looking at that right now. Oh, my gosh. They are currently at 43 degrees, but they are under a potential disruption due to snow and ice. Wow. Paris is 44 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 47 degrees and mostly cloudy with their own weather advisory that is a potential disruption due to wind. So hold on to your hold on to your scarves in Rome. I know I would just generally. Uh, let's see. Kiev is 22 degrees with fog. Kabul is 32 and fair. Hong Kong is 60 degrees and clear. Tokyo is 45 degrees and clear with a weather advisory. Is it the dry air warning again? Yes, it is. They have had a dry air advisory now going looks going on its second week, a whole other week ahead. And they look like they are forecast uh, with a dry, dry air advisory through this whole week. Wow. Okay, well, I'm going to be drinking a lot of fluids just thinking about how dry Tokyo is. Sydney, Australia is 76 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunny and crisp as New York should be. That's the Big Apple for you. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Christian Shepherd of Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Ash Mondays. Dateline Beijing. A Chinese court today jailed prominent rights lawyer Wang Guangzheng for four and a half years for subversion of state power. A sentence denounced by Human Rights Watch as a mockery of Beijing's claims to champion the rule of law. Wang, who had taken cases deemed sensitive by authorities, such as accusations of police torture or defending members of the banned Falun Gong spiritual movement, went missing in August of 2015 amid a crackdown on rights activists and lawyers. Wow, that was four years ago. In a short statement on his website, the Dianjin No. 2 Intermediate People's Court in the northern port city of Zhanjin said that Wang had been found guilty. It was not possible to contact Wang for government since he's been disappeared for over four years. After Wang's December 26 hearing, the United Nations called on authorities to ensure his due process rights are respected and said that there were serious human rights concerns about the way his case had been handled. Now, does the sentence start now or the four years already served? The verdict makes a mockery of President Xi Jinping's claims to champion the rule of law. And that was by a Hong Kong-based researcher for Human Rights Watch, uh, Wang Yaqi. Well, I don't think he's going to be around very much longer either. I mean, China's just right across the bay from Hong Kong. And the Justice uh, Ministry did not respond to a faxed request for comment on the case because they're still doing faxes. I wonder if they have AOL still. China's criminal law requires that time spent in detention prior to sentencing be deducted, suggesting Wang could be released earlier than his four-and-a-half-year jail term. I don't think he's going to be released earlier. I think he's going to serve out the other six months, and then they'll serve out the full term. During his court appearance, Wang fired his state-appointed lawyer, uh, who, that was according to his wife, Li Wenzhou, who was barred from leaving her Beijing home and could not attend the trial. 
It is not known if Wang defended himself during the trial or whether he will appeal the sentence. Wang's case had been shrouded in secrecy and uncertainty as authorities have released little information about his well-being and have denied access to his wife and the seven lawyers she has appointed to defend him. One of the lawyers, Yu Wang Shang, had been Wang's defense attorney before he was stripped of his license and then arrested in January. He is now being investigated for inciting subversion. Well, in China, when you defend someone who's considered a subversive, well, of course you're inciting subversion by defending them. China routinely rejects foreign criticism of, of its human rights record, saying all Chinese are treated equally in accordance with the law and that foreign countries have no right to interfere because China knows best. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Our final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes our way by way of Reuters with reporting by Gus Trompies and Michelle Rose. Dateline, Paris. Thousands of protesters marched through Paris yesterday to condemn violence in the Yellow Vest movement that, that has rocked France for weeks with angry protests over President Emmanuel Macron's rule. Some 10,000 people turned out for Sunday's counter-demonstration a day after an 11th consecutive Saturday of Yellow Vest demonstrations across France that brought sporadic clashes with police. Pro participants, some wearing red scarves after the name of the counter-movement, displayed slogans like Stop the Violence and Hands Off My Republic in a peaceful afternoon procession in eastern Paris that ended in Bastille Square. Saturday's Yellow Vest March in the capital also ended at the Bastille, where small groups confronted police and a demonstrator suffered an eye wound that inflamed a debate about whether the authorities are using excessive force. Now, let's remember, the Yellow Vests are pretty much a right-wing uh, shock troop, okay? Let's remember that. They want uh, immigrants out. They, they oppose a fuel tax rise and any number of other things that are on the right-wing wish list. Now, the yellow vest protesters who wear fluorescent jackets French motorists are required to have in their cars took to the streets in November. Their movement then developed into a broader revolt against the government. Around 69,000 people attended the latest Saturday protests, including 4,000 in Paris, a lower turnout than the previous weekend. However, the injury to well-known activist Jerome Rodriguez attracted more television coverage on Sunday than the Red Scarves March, as it heightened debate over use by police of dispersal grenades and so-called flashball pellet guns. To help quell discontent, Macron this month launched a series of public debates that he has promised will lead to changes. Only if people want to change. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. Now, you know, Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on all day and all night. We'll meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays because that is what we do. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Boom, petite.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 